Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. session of the 2019 Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a presentation called Echo Voice for Open Simulator. Our speakers today are going to be Lisa Laxon and Frank Ruloff, and also will be joined by Natasha Vru and Troy Schultz, which is Seth Nygaard. Uh, please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details, and sessions of our sessions, as well as the full schedule of events. I will briefly introduce our panel speakers today, and please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for the full bios, details of the sessions, and the full schedule. Uh, Lisa Laxon, or Shalen Eres, is the R&D visionary and CEO of the Open Simulator Community uh, Focused uh, Infinite Metaverse Alliance, or IMA. And she's also president of Laxton Consulting LLC. And she has experience providing various virtual world technology solutions for education, research, business, and defense clients. For more on her work, please see infinitemetaverse.com. Frank Ruloff is a senior systems engineer at Thales Netherlands with expertise in training and simulation. He's leading the research and innovation activities related to open simulator technology with the Thales Global Company, using multiple open simulator grids focused on user needs. And Natasha Brew is an engineering student at CPE Lyon in France, specialized in network architecture and cybersecurity. She works as an intern of Thales NL and has been charged to review the SceneGate viewer security issues. And then Troy Schultz, or Seth Nygaard, is the CTO and developer. He's a multidiscipline developer with 30 plus years experience in real-time systems for industrial automotive and other critical environments. He has worked in the roles of senior hardware designer, senior systems administrator, engineering manager, and chief technology officer at various companies, and was the owner operator of the Refuge Grid. Uh, combining a keen interest in virtual worlds with his professional experiences, he has uh, been an active builder, tester, and developer using the Open Simulator platform. Well, today's presentation is on the development of a new open source scene gate viewer focused on improvements in usability, accessibility, and interoperability. This session is being live streamed and record, recorded. So if you have uh, any questions or comments during the session, you may send your tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag uh, PoundOSCC19. Welcome, everyone, and let's begin the session. Thank you very much, Sun, and uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, this presentation will focus on uh, one aspect, not only the SceneGate viewer, but in this case, the voice of IP um, that is uh, related to OpenSim. As we all know, we have a number of ways to have audio in our OpenSim environment. Um, that's great. Uh, we have uh, lots of support from uh, VVox in the past and we use FreeSwitch, but we have also some other needs for a voice application. Those needs are coming from the fact that for privacy reasons and sometimes for business reasons, but also for security reasons, we can not have public users or require voice of IP services that are not encrypted or not standard. In general, we also have a, um, a good uh, alternative in, in case some of these VOP providers fall away. So to start, what, what we started with uh, in the application is to look at what kind of application we would like to build and we built upon. First of all, we want to have spatial audio, just as we have it now in, uh, in the VFOX uh, Voice of IP. Uh, we want to have it open source, and so not propriety, and it must integrate with OpenSIM. So what kinds of use cases can we uh, see for this uh, Voice of IP uh, application. If you look at VFOX, then we see that it's a third party unencrypted voice um, stream. And that could be intercepted from a security perspective. 
Uh, there are also uh, other reasons why we should have voice of IP services that are not go through a public voice of IP provider. And that is dependent on the information that is shared over this voice of IP. For instance, for training, all training that contains private information from the participants should not be shared publicly. For military training, that's a general requirement because uh, militaries do not like to have voice of IP servers that they don't have under control. But we are also have business examples, meetings between companies that uh, should kept internal to those companies for private information. And also meetings that contain, uh, that would contain private information. Some use cases are, if you look at security, meetings where health of persons is discussed, that information is also private and restricted. Uh, any meetings that uh, use sensitive information uh, on people, say banks or courts. Meetings that contain classified information, government, military, examples, Moses and Thales, for instance. Our company is a defense contractor and we are very restrictive to what kind of information we are able to share. There's also another need that, for instance, for in-world counseling and education, there are laws that prescribe this kind of uh, private uh, privacy. In the US, that are FERPA and HIPAA, but also there are uh, comparable laws in Europe as well. Another perspective is cost. Sometimes it is more cost effective to create your own voice of IP server than uh, to use uh, voice of IP services from other providers. With the Echo Voice, that's the application that we want to build, we deliver an integrated encrypted audio stream solution over OpenSIM Seengate Viewer under control of the grid and region owner. So in that case, you can build a, a grid which is totally controlled by yourself. When we started this, we worked together with uh, VCOM in the past and we managed to build up our own uh, Thales local area network with uh, the voice of IP server that we uh, provided. That was built on Whisper and Murmur. And here you see a schematic overview of how this uh, application worked with OpenSIM and the viewer. That was mostly based on the same uh, on, on the interfaces that already exist for the VFOX, uh, uh, for the VFOX solution. And the VFOX solution LLSLVoice.exe was simply replaced by an equivalent for, sim for Whisper and Murmur. So what we have now, or what we created in, in our local area network for, Thala, for the Thales global company was an open source voice of IP server based on Mumble and Murmur, which we have spatial audio, uh, audio, we have better noise cancellation than with respect to the, voice, uh, the VFOX uh, voice of IP. We have parcel audio, which helps into separate video, uh, audio uh, between parts of the uh, region or parts of the grid even. They are encrypted and we host those voice of IP servers ourselves. What we don't have yet in the solution is that we are able to have uh, IM audio, so discussion between two avatars using voice of IP. Group audio, and we only in, in this case uh, made this application for uh, Windows supported viewers. And we have to still look at the Apple and the Linux viewer, but that later. The name that we choose for the application is based on the name of the Greed codex for sound echo. So one of the things that we would like to do is to create a roadmap for Echo Voice for the future so that uh, the community 
can participate in its functionality and in its features. Um, this is very important to us. We like to have the information from the user community to build upon. And we create a roadmap in which we will uh, put all the things that we want to do with the Echo Voice application. So we already mentioned, we already put some of them in a roadmap. Uh, one of them is the, the package build modernization. Um, the current uh, voice, the current application is uses very old libraries and old uh, components. Some are even are uh, not even able to be uh, to be get anymore. Um, of course, we want to um, we want to support Apple and Linux viewers. Um, we want to improve security uh, so that it complies with the different laws, especially in Europe but also with the US laws. And that is one thing that has already started. We said we'll talk about that uh, after my, uh, my talk. Um, we provide, uh, we want to provide IM uh, voice of IP, group voice of IP. We want to investigate text to speech in real time and speech to text uh, with, the viewer, uh, with the viewer together. And one of the other things that we have on the roadmap is to look at the look at the way to integrate into the viewers, and in our case the ZeneGate viewer, um, to be able to switch between our voice over IP providers. Uh, the background of that would be that not everyone would support our, uh, not every grid would probably support our solution, so that we still people are able with the same viewer to whenever grid they go or whenever region they go, they can switch between different voice of IP providers. And the other thing that we have on the roadmap is to allow voice over IP communication between non-avatars and avatars so that you can have uh, avatars that are outside the virtual world, but still with voice communicate inside the virtual world. This could be, for instance, for beneficiary, if you're doing meetings and the people that have to attend the meeting are not able to come online for whatever reason they are. But that gives some, uh, some additional problems, of course, because how do you represent those non-avatars in the environment that you are holding the meeting and so on. So a little overview over the development that we have done until now. The first step we've done is that we worked together with VCOM in Switzerland, which orig originally said had put some of the source code for Mumble uh, whisper online uh, some long, long time ago and we hired them to work with us to try to get a solution for our grids on the Thales network. That was the first step that we did. So they supplied us with an initial version which we worked on um, together with VCOM. Then uh, the second step, we created a working solution on our own intranet with the possibility to build different applications. Um, and then the second, when that was finished, IMA, uh, in this case SET, uh, took the work over from us to testing it and deploying it for the internet. And in that case, provided to a larger public, uh, to a larger public as well. So we are going to talk in a little bit about the work that uh, SET is doing now and how far we are with releasing the first uh, versions of the uh, Echo Voice application. But we are very interested in meeting people or developers that would like to join our effort, to like to joining our development team. Um, um, so if anybody in the public would like to participate in that, we uh, please uh, talk to Lisa, to me, to Seth, uh, and we can see what we can do with that.
So, as I said, the current status of development, we want to have a internet-based solution as soon as possible. We're already looking at step one, package build modernization. And the topics in development, I will turn my speaker over now to set who is going to tell more about the work he has been doing to get these points uh, running. Set to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, let's go to my first slide. So this this shows what uh, we currently have with the mumble and murmur voice solution as our echo voice. Um, what we've done is we've created a intermediary program application between the viewer and the mumble client. We call that echo voice bridge. Um, that is basically an abstraction layer. To, um, helps us helps us avoid some of the issues that the vcom solution has where the e exe has to be swapped out each time what we've done is we take the sl voice exe and rename it and then our voice bridge goes in dropped in in the sl voice dot exe um, that minimizes what the user has to do each time when they want to switch voice solutions the Voice bridge then can work with both the mumble client and the SL voice renamed Vivox client as well. So you can easily switch back and forth between the two voice solutions. On the server side, we use the um, currently I have not made any changes to the VCOM add in yet for the voice and the murmur server. So on the server side, uh, that that as yet has not been updated. I've been concentrating on the client side to get that working um, and make it a little bit more convenient for anyone who wants to test it. And that's actually working quite well now. Uh, let's go to our next slide. Some of the advantages we have with Mumble, um, you know, it's a it, it, it's a well proven solution. It's low latency, has good noise reduction, reduction, proven codecs, resulting in a good high quality voice. Um, I actually find it to be better quality than what Vivox is. Um, some of it is is user de, user preference as well, but so far I've been quite impressed with the with the Mumble voice solution. It's fully encrypted. Uh, end to end, both control channels and the voice. This improves the privacy. It has built in spatial um, volume control already. Um, we will be supporting Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems. I currently have it functional on Windows. The Echo Voice Bridge is functional under Linux. I am in the process of uh, setting up a build so I can build the old Mumble client, which is modified. Uh, for Linux. Um, I will be updating those Mumble clients to something newer, which will make that a lot easier. Um, Mumble is also a open source project with a large user base, so we're not reinventing the wheel or starting off from scratch. We're able to build on an already proven solution. Uh, it's well documented and there's still an active development team despite the fact that Mumble went a few years without a major update. Uh, let's do it our ne next slide. So what have we done with the Echo Voice Bridge? What I've done is I emulate the SL Voice EXE command line. Um, I make use of more of the command line parameters than what the modified Mumble does. Uh, I've made some improvements to the Mumble, the modified Mumble client. Um, and what I've done allows I can do one single install for Echo Voice Bridge and easily add that into multiple viewer installs on the same system. Um, so I have it currently working with Firestorm, Alchemy, Singularity, as well as Seengate. Um, and I'm able to, to set Firestorm up to use Vivox, Alchemy to use um, Mumble, and they run independently of each other, even though there's there's one, one central install. 
and I've tested it with both 32 and 64 bit viewers. And this was one of the reasons why I did the Echo Voice Bridge um, solution. It's written in modern C++, trying to keep it as bare bones as possible to minimize DLL conflicts. Uh, the various viewers use, ver use um, different DLLs, and if you drop the entire mumble solution in, as has been done with VCOM solution, you run into some issues where you may break the viewer or it, it doesn't behave correctly because of conflicts. Um, let's do our next slide, please. So here we have our overview of what happens on the server side. Uh, the add-in plugs into the region instance, um, and then you have a Murmur server. Now the Murmur server is a separate executable. It can reside on the same server or a different server, and there's a 0C ICE um, RPC mechanism that's used between the region module and the Murmur server to add users, handle the access control lists, um, and actually move, move users between channels automatically. In the background, the Murmur server has its own database for users. Um, so once a user has been added, they become persistent. Um, and the same zero ice mechanism it can be used for monitoring tools or future tools all at the same time. Um, let's go to our next slide. So initially on the client side, we have the viewer and we have our, our echo voice bridge, which essentially runs as a transparent voice proxy at this time. Um, taking the XLL XML commands and merely proxying them back and forth between either the Echo Voice agent or the Vivox agent. Um, this allows an easy path to get us working with the uh, with the current solution with VCOM, with only some minor new modifications um, to handle some features I wanted from the proxy for Mumble. Uh, let's do our next slide, please. In the future, though, I'm going to remove most of the XML handling that was added into the Mumble agent. Um, I'm trying to keep the Mumble agent as generic and close to the stock Mumble client as possible. Uh, we'll make use of the Mumble link game, which, is, which already exists for multiple games. It, it, that's where the spatial voice is handled. I will replace the the XML with a control API solution, likely not using XML. Um, haven't fully decided what I'm going to do there. I have some ideas though. And once that's done, that allows the voice bridge to look at the URLs that are being used for voice and automatically decide whether it needs to use the Vivox agent or the Mumble agent. So from a user perspective on the hypergrid, if you were in a region running Vivox and you teleported to another grid that was running Mumble, you wouldn't have to restart your viewer or anything. It would simply connect to the Mumble agent and your voice would work on the new grid and return back to Vivox when you go to another region. Um, this involves uh, quite a bit of refactoring, um, but it... Uh, I think it gives us a more solid solution and a, uh, quite a bit easier to troubleshoot and develop, I believe, despite the extra, the increased complexity. The other advantage that the bridge gives us is once we have the functionality in the bridge of handling all the second life uh, viewer commands, we can then look at extending this to other voice solutions if needed. Um, yeah, it actually is working right now. Um, so uh, qu quite happy with what started out as a proof of concept. I have it working on, on two test grids um, behaving quite well. So let's do our next slide. So now really where we are, right? We've done 
through the work that 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 Frank's group has done at, in, in Thales with their existing solution and the work I've done with the proof of concept. Um, we're well on our way to each of these steps, uh, but now we want to involve the community. So we really need to determine what the community needs for a voice solution. Uh, we know what we have. We know as, as a community, I think we have a good idea of what we want. Uh, so we'd like to hear from you what features you want to see and don't want to see in a voice solution, and then we can roll that in where we're practical, uh, review everything that's existing, and create some some additional baselines for comparison. So is one voice solution actually better than another, or what features do we need? Our, our design development, uh, we need, really need to determine what improvements are required. Um, get more developers involved and especially testers. Uh, these solutions really, the only way to test them is to use them. Uh, and that, that really only works when you have multiple people in a, in a region. Um, so the proof of concept is, is currently working. Um, that will continue to be developed and, and expanded out. Um, so, and we'll do some unit testing. So as we make future changes, we continue to test for, re for regression issues. Um, and we will do some type of roadmap as we add features for what can be done short term and, and long term. Um, and most importantly, document uh, both the installation, the usage and the build process. Uh, currently trying to build the old Mumble client is not easy. Um, it's 10 years old now, so several of the dependencies are severely deprecated. Um, they even require Microsoft Studio 2008 to build a couple of the dependencies, and that's no longer downloadable from Microsoft. And we will be providing downloads to the community to, for testing, uh, both for the viewer and the server side. Um, and I think that uh, the next slide is the is the end of my part of the presentation. Thank okay. you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we, we we are now going to the panel discussion. So, if there are any questions or things we'd like to discuss on on the voice of IP uh, solution that we are providing, we would like to hear that. Hi, this is uh, Lisa. Thank you, Frank and Seth, both. Uh, wonderful presentation, a lot of information. Uh, I'm sure the developers are just drooling right now uh, at the possibility of having a replacement self-hosted Echo solution. Uh, but I wanted to note here, uh, we're getting some feedback in chat. If you take a look at that, uh, your teacher said the ability for people who cannot handle heavy graphics loads to still have access to the voice channel. Uh, the other uh, gentle heron mentioned, which was also mentioned in the presentation, is the text-to-speech, or in this case, speech-to-text, voice-to-text, text-to-voice is the same thing. Uh, we definitely have that on the roadmap. Uh, it's pretty much uh, an integrated point between the SceneGate viewer development and Echo Voice. Um, Seth, do you want to address Marcus's question in chat? Okay, then. So, you're curious whether web RTC signaling and server uh, have been considered. It's on our radar. Uh, it is something we've looked at. Web RTC is, it'll be a lot more work to try and do anything spatial. Um, we could possibly add it, although. The current work is certainly concentrating on Mumble, uh, building on what already exists. Once we have the the voice bridge fully flushed out, I am looking at WebRTC. I'm also looking at, at Matrix as a as a possibility, and a a a VoIP uh, SIP bridge 
some of these already exist for a couple of the solutions, so plugging that in should not be that difficult where somebody could literally phone into a grid and participate in a discussion. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Well, one, one of the things I, I would like to add is, of course, that we don't want to lose things like spatial audio uh, in, 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 because it's important in, the, in, in a virtual environment like this Correct. to have spatial uh, a spatial uh, audio. Right, now there is one point there uh, of difference in terms of accessibility. We have already implemented a feature in the SceneGate viewer uh, that allows you to listen from all positions. And what this does is effectively um, focus the spatial sound within the 40 meter range uh, of roll off for the voice. Um, as you know, uh, some of the devs out there can confirm uh, the default uh, voice range is 80 meters, but the roll off that occurs naturally, really the voice is not heard uh, loud enough once you get 40 meters away. The, the issue with the spatial audio in a meeting environment for people who are hearing impaired, cognitive impaired, mobility impaired, uh, or who are new users, uh, not really familiar, this allows people to listen from all positions equally, or what Firestorm used to call hear voice equally from everyone. This is already available in the SceneGate viewer, so it makes it an option. However, when you are engaging in an immersive environment where you do want that spatial sound, you have the option to change it to avatar position or camera position. So we're considering uh, the broad range of use cases in the integrated development that we're doing. I'm already seeing questions about where they can uh, get instructions for testing and download. Uh, we'll make that available soon. Yes, and the question on Mumble Server is a Docker image. That's actually quite easy. Um, I have a preliminary test copy of a Docker image already working. Uh, I'm doing a lot of my testing in a in a VMware um, guest. Um, as well as I have a test grid set up on the internet as well. That's hypergrid accessible. But yes, uh, Docker image is definitely on the roadmap. Frank, did you have um, anything else you wanted to mention? Well, I, I would like to mention, and maybe some of, of, of the, the people in the audience already noticed that I, I'm very, I come from a professional software development environment and one of the things that I hope that we can do here is to create um, a group of people, a group of developers, including the associated procedures and ways of working to get software that is not only working very well and complies to uh, what the community likes to have, but also is very well documented because for one of the things that I find most important is that people that are working, people that are working in and do and making um, their time to build software in their free time, if the threshold to give this information, to give your source to somebody else gets too high, then all that work eventually goes to zero because nobody is, is being able to take the flag as we tell it and somebody else can continue with it. So one of the things I'm, I'm very favorable of and also with this, uh, with this application is to not only get a good product and not only get good software and tested software, but also get it very well documented so that we can uh, maybe enthusiast people to work with us together and they understand uh, quickly how to change the software, how to add something to the software and uh, well, that will benefit us all um, in the long run. And I think that's a really good point because if we have documentation uh, that is clear and structured, it's easier to troubleshoot things. It's easier to go back um, when you have a developer may leave the team. That knowledge is not lost. 
uh, we need to make sure we capture the knowledge uh, while the work is being done. Uh, but also, I believe it helps improve participation because you have people that can come from outside of the virtual world arena, but maybe they have some great developer skills and they can get involved. You know, we want to bring in new users and to expand the community user base uh, in general. So that documentation also ties in with that effort. Uh, it also allows us to look at things like standards compliance. Uh, it, are we, is the application compliant with industry standards to make it easier to integrate uh, and write APIs to integrate with other applications outside of the virtual world platform. Uh, this will help us uh, really expand the use of Open Simulator into the industry sector. That industry sector then supports education, it supports government, it supports public school systems, uh, it supports uh, different medical advocacy programs uh, that need to see how they can use virtual world to help them uh, in their own environments. It, we should not just limit us to uh, going to creativity and uh, social events. There's a lot more that we can do with Open Simulator, but we have to design the software so that we can expand out into those other communities. Um, Moodle is mentioned here by Sun. Uh, Kay earlier mentioned Canvas. Uh, that's a good example of two other applications that we need to have some way to hook. And that's how you do that is through APIs and through standards compliance. Well, uh, I, can, I can say something up. Years ago, when we started to look at this uh, at OpenSIM, we already integrated OpenSIM with Sloodle, so that that worked. The SL, the Moodle for Second Life, we also uh, I was also able to integrate that uh, presentation tool that they have with OpenSIM. So yeah, we we did some experimentation that in the past. So there is a you can of course uh, integrate Moodle with OpenSIM uh, as it is in the past. The other thing I maybe want to mention, uh, Lisa, is the fact that uh, we are saying we like to have the features from the community. So we also have uh, in our uh, documentation, in our procedures, we have a way that outside people uh, will be able to put their thoughts about what they want on paper so mm -hmm. that we can start some uh, process internally to evaluate it, discuss it with other people, and get to eventually to the points that will come on the roadmap. Right. And, uh, you know, what Frank is referring to is basically when someone has a new feature request or an enhancement, uh, we'll provide them with a white paper template. Uh, and they will basically do a little white paper to tell us what it is they would like, what need is it addressing, um, why do they think it is necessary, where do they think the um, architecture may be impacted, where they believe it might fit in the roadmap. Um, all this information is basically, we want you to sell to us what your idea is so that we can seriously consider that and have it integrated in our internal change management process. Uh, now, this is a little bit different than what most of the open source programs out there do. Uh, what we're doing is bringing some industry software uh, approaches into an open source project. And uh, our intent there is to avoid spaghetti code and to keep uh, the project maintainable and sustainable with adequate documentation uh, through generations of developers. And also supplying the features the community wants. Yes, and, and that's, you know, speaking of users as developers. We, we know there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is uh, for developers to make something and hope that the users like it. The other school of thought is listen to the users to find out what the users want and develop accordingly to help meet those needs. And that is the perspective of users as developers, and that's the perspective we're taking.
Now, Delipo made a comment about um, the Canvas, uh, which just bought for $2 billion by an equity company. That is something to look into to see what the impact has been, uh, if the source is uh, still going to have adequate uh, API standards so we can hook to that if needed with the viewer. That's right, Selby, you could right on target. Design thinking with the systems engineering approach is exactly uh, what IMA and Thales agreed to when we formed a strategic partnership. We have a lot of the same uh, common goals, uh, even if the markets are different. Thank you for that link, Barbara. Was there anything else uh, you wanted to mention, Frank? No, that's it. I think uh, I love this presentation. I hope that uh, lots of people. Uh, um, I love the way that that you can do virtual conferences like this, because it allows a lot of people to be and hear and uh, get the information, which otherwise would not be possible. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, I'm glad uh, everybody uh, had a chance to make it in this morning. I know it was a long night last night, and congratulations uh, to the organizers on the first day uh, of the conference, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. We'll be talking more about the Seengate Viewer today at 11 o'clock Pacific time, and I hope you all will join us for that session. Cool. Oh, also, I didn't know if you uh, had noticed in the uh, discussion a little, little bit earlier dur during the presentation, uh, you had talked about uh, bringing people in that wouldn't be physically present in world. Um, it, it might help to look at some other platforms and things that they've done well. It might give you ideas for approaches. Uh, there was one that was uh, from Sun Microsystems called Open Wonderland. And they had some interesting, innovative ideas. One was a spider phone so that somebody could um, basically call in to be in the meeting without having to have their, themselves be there in avatar form. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with that is that um, if the person doesn't want to be in the virtual world because they're not really as accepting of the technology, they can still take part in the discussion without having to be physically embodied there. So that also might be a baby step too. They, they're doing it through a spider phone and then later they might come in avatar form as they see the, um, the usefulness of doing it within that environment. Yes, I think, I think that that is a great idea. And the presentation I did last year or the, the year before, I also mentioned that if in the environment that I'm in, which is an industrial environment, that there is a sort of psychic threshold to use these kinds of um, these kinds of applications in virtual world um, you see that people when i give them presentation on what they could do with it they always nod and say oh yeah this is great and we can we can use it but they never come back to it and i also noticed that uh, the only the only people that return are the people that they discover the benefits from it when they use it they mm -hmm. don't discover the benefits when they look at the presentation or you give them a demonstration or demonstration already better. Yeah. But they really I, see the benefit when they are going to use it. And that makes it sometimes difficult to more or less sell uh, because in industry you have to sell something to get money to develop it. Uh, it gives it difficult to sell because a lot of people, they look at it and they say, yeah, it's great. But uh, especially if you look at people that are older, they first the first thing is to say, ah, that's a game. Yeah, 65 it's not plus serious. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not serious. It's a game. Yeah. Uh, younger people are more used to it because they, they play games. But still, it's very difficult to get people over this threshold uh, to let them uh, actually see the benefits of using these kind of applications. Well, one, one thing I think that at least I've found from my background to be helpful is that I don't think we should think of people in two ways as either being someone that uses virtual worlds or someone that doesn't use it. And I think it's the, there's a tendency right. to kind of develop that thought process. But the thing is, you got to take baby steps with some. 
Some have to crawl before they'll walk, before they'll run. Some run right out of the gate. So it's just a matter of understanding that we might need to have different ramps that bring people in. And they might not all use things the same way. And that's okay. It's just like for education, you know, being able to educate people where somebody's on a computer and someone's on an iPad or an Android tablet or somebody's on a phone, you know, I mean, different levels of usage is okay. We don't have to have the same solution for every person for it to work. But then that also means for things like the development you're talking about, how do you make things that work for all those users to be able to communicate together like they're in that same place? Right, and, and, and that's where you we have the approach of the non-avatar uh, being a, a user who may be engaged in a voice conversation, uh, but not necessarily represented by an avatar. And, and one of the things we have to do is think about how we're going to represent that voice presence to the users that are in the virtual world. So that's that's another aspect as well. Yeah, um, and I think in but, that case with the spider phone, what they did is they thought, well, how would we do this in a regular meeting that we do in real life? And then they found ways to work that into the virtual. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you know? I think that's a good idea. Um, another one that was kind of uh, innovative that they had too is they had this one in Open Wonderland. I think it was um, uh, the Dome of Silence. If you remember the TV series Get Smart, uh, yeah. basically this uh, thing would come down. You, you, you would be in a silence zone. So if somebody was just outside your classroom, they couldn't hear what was going on or see what was going on in the screens or even uh, see the text chat that's inside that room. And it's just an interesting perspective to be able to have that kind of a security system. Sometimes that's useful for educators as well. And before we run out of time, um, there are some things coming into the chat. I, I wanted to make sure we capture those. Uh, Star mentioned that it was good to put voice into text so it can be translated to another language real time. Yes, that is uh, part of our roadmap. And um, your teacher talked about lag, uh, broadcasting voice from Discord. Uh, so these are all things that we want to look at. And as expected, we're getting questions about when do we plan to release the code. I'll have to have Seth address that one. Uh, and Kayaker uh, talks about large presentations like this. Uh, I believe, if I'm correct, Seth, uh, probably 100 users is easy to handle with the technology. Is that right? Uh, yes, 100, 100 users would be quite easy. And it's, it would not be that difficult to do a bridge from, from the Murmur server directly into Skype or YouTube um, for streaming like we are here. Yeah, and, and one of the things we hope is that we have a solution readily available for the Abacon folks to use at the next conference. Uh, you may be able to eliminate uh, the Skype bridge. Okay, that sounds interesting. Well, we want to uh, wrap things up now. Uh, we want to thank you, uh, Lisa and Frank and Natasha and Seth, uh, for this great panel discussion. Uh, it was a ter terrific presentation as well. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Uh, following this session, the next session will begin at 8.30 in this keynote region, and it's entitled Dockerizing Open Simulator. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 19 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the hypergrid tour resources which are available in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with uh, crowd sponsors uh, booths and sponsors uh, booths uh, that are located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our speakers and to the audience. Thank you all. Thank you all very Thank much.